Today I'm going to be picking up where I left off in the last video where I was speaking about King Charles III brokering the peace between the Palestinians and Israel and the ultra-Orthodox sect of the Sanhedrin that are Antichrist spirit that are the ones that appoint a king to rule over them. King Charles III would serve as a figurehead over the nations, and this would be them applying to becoming members of the Commonwealth under the king. And I want to discuss the Commonwealth in this episode so that it makes it quite clear what can possibly be happening in the near future with the king and Israel. Since the British government helped to found the nation of Israel with the Balfour Declaration, Israel's entire system politically is based on the British parliamentary system. It's based upon their laws and rules. So they could easily become part of the Commonwealth, which I had found some information saying that they had been considering it. So the question is, was Israel ever a commonwealth? And if they were, how easy it is to appoint a king that's the anointed one, meaning Messiah in the Sanhedrin's eyes. The Sanhedrin want to be the world's judges. They want to implement the laws of ancient times including death penalties and everything else the way that it was in ancient times. And Ephesians 2.12 tells us that at that time ye were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This verse is not only telling you that Israel and its monarchy were the commonwealth of Israel, but also that this had to do with the covenants of promise. When the king, King Charles III, if he is indeed the one that the Sanhedrin chooses to be their Messiah, their king, sitting on the throne of Judah and restoring that throne, which the Lord had revealed to me, which I shared with you in my video from Revelation 13, that this is what they were doing. This is what they were going to be doing in the future. And this is telling you that the commonwealth of Israel, under the monarchy and the kingship, had to do with the covenants. So this tells me that part of this covenant with many could include... Israel signing up to be part of a covenant with the king, and it would be included in the covenant with many, which is the blood covenant of the red heifer ceremony that can never take away the Jewish people's sins, nor can it cleanse them from any uncleanness, because it's only the Lord God of Israel who came and prepared a body to dwell in as the second perfect Adam that is the only one that could take away our sins from the first Adam and Eve to take us back into the Garden of Eden-like state and reverse the curse of death from sin. But this red heifer could never take away their sins or purify the Jews worldwide, which they claim to uh, I should say the rabbis claim that the Jews worldwide are still in their sins. But that's because they rejected the Messiah's blood covenant with many. And so this king will put them under the commonwealth of Israel again with a covenant to strengthen their covenant with God by the blood and ashes of a red heifer. Now, even though Israel has no king and have not had a king since Zedekiah's eyes were blinded and the whole monarchy system 
went downhill and the ruling arm shriveled, withered, and this is why Jesus was performing those miracles. I had told you this before. This was from Divine Revelation of the Lord, and I had shared it in prior videos. But in Philippians, we see in chapter 3, verse 20, and this is just part of it, but it says, Also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord, Jesus Messiah, or Christ, but for us, the commonwealth of God exists in the heavens, from where also we are waiting for the Savior. So the commonwealth exists in the heavens, and that's the king of kings, monarchy, and his commonwealth. But the Sanhedrin is rejecting the commonwealth of God, trading it for an earthly king, that has a commonwealth that they will be subjected to because they will put themselves under an earthly king and whatever that king implements, that is what the people will have to do. Now, when you have, we already have Nikki Haley nominated as the first president, according to the half shekel coin, her face is on it. The Sanhedrin wants to rid the world of the United Nations and replace it with the 70 nations delegation, of which they have already put Nikki Haley on the coin to be the first president of the 70 nations delegation. So that means she's already got a position secured. They are manipulating behind the scenes. And I also found information that they were telling Donald Trump if he wanted to be president that he would have to do things to elevate them in a certain secret message behind the scenes. So this covenant with many is part of a covenant of the promises of God that Israel will be strengthening when the Sanhedrin performs this red heifer ceremony that can never take away sins. And so this is why the man of sin is revealed at the time of the sacrificial red heifer, because they will strengthen the laws of God as they were in ancient times and be subjecting all of Israel to these laws and whatever their weird beliefs are. Now, I say that because they have harassed the women at the Western Wall, the Jewish women already. So the time of Jacob's trouble is going to put all Jews under the jurisdiction of the Sanhedrin judges. And you know what happened to Stephen, he was stoned because he was speaking the truth about King Messiah, Yeshua. And let me just tell you a little bit more about this commonwealth. So I'm going to share with you what is going to happen here with Israel accepting the king as their anointed one. He will be considered the Messiah when this happens. And just like Moses was a man, but he was a type of Messiah, a type of savior. They will look to this king and set him on the throne of Judah, thereby reestablishing the ancient monarchy of Israel. And here is what I had discovered before when I started talking about this. The Commonwealth, is there a place for Israel? What is the relationship between Britain and Israel? And this was a Jerusalem Post article that I had discovered and couldn't believe it, but it says, an event that received scant attention in the world's media was Queen Elizabeth II's opening of the biennial Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in London on April 16, 2018. Inadequate global coverage has been the fate of the Commonwealth for many years. The Commonwealth is a facet of contemporary life that most people know or care little about. 
When Elizabeth came to the throne in 1952, the Commonwealth consisted of just seven nations. Today, it's a voluntary association of 56 independent sovereign states with a combined population of some 2.4 billion people, almost a third of the world's inhabitants. Most, but not all, of the member states were once part of the now defunct British Empire, which explains why the Queen was head of the organization. So the king would be the head of the organization. But what unites this diverse group of nations beyond the ties of history, language, and institutions are strong trade links and the association's 16 core values set out in the Commonwealth Charter. These Commonwealth values commit the organization to promoting world peace, democracy, individual liberty, environmental sustainability, equality in terms of race and gender, free trade, and the fight against poverty, ignorance, and disease. In short, the Commonwealth stands for all that is good in the wicked world. It was in 1884 that Lord Rosebery, later a British Prime Minister, first dubbed the British Empire a Commonwealth of Nations and the designation British Commonwealth remained uncontroversial until 1947 when India achieved independence. Although the new state became a republic, the Indian government was very keen to remain in the Commonwealth, and the Commonwealth, unwilling to lose the jewel in its crown, found no difficulty in changing the rules of the club. Henceforth, British was to be dropped from the title of the organization and membership did not have to be based on allegiance to the British crown. Members were to be free and equal members of the Commonwealth of Nations, freely cooperating in the pursuit of peace, liberty, and progress. Since then, fully independent countries from all parts of the globe have flocked to join the Commonwealth at first, all were required to have some historic connection to the old British Empire until two nations with absolutely no such ties applied to join. Once again, the Commonwealth demonstrated a flexibility remarkable in bureaucracies and by sleight of hand further amended the rules to allow first Mozambique and a few years later Rwanda to join applications and expressions of interest in joining the Commonwealth continue to arrive from a wide variety of states. Back in 2012, the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Select Committee considered the role and future of the Commonwealth and in general welcomed the idea of the organization extending its membership always provided a stringent selection procedure was maintained. We welcome the fact that the Commonwealth continues to attract interest from potential new members, reads the final paragraph of their report, and see advantages in greater diversity and an extended global reach for the Commonwealth. So, Sanhedrin wants to be the global world court replacing the United Nations, and Nikki Haley is on the half-shuckle coin which funds the third temple and Donald Trump is the other face on the half shekel coin already. This is why I told you I believed that these elections are already determined because there's this elite group of ultra-orthodox Sanhedrin that are trying to set all of this in place and they're using these people to implement what they want in the world to happen. We welcome the fact that the Commonwealth continues to attract interest from potential new members, reads the final paragraph of their report, and see advantages in greater diversity and an extended global reach for the Commonwealth. However, it is crucial that the application process is rigorous and that any new members are appropriate additions to the Commonwealth family, closely adhering at all times to its principles and values. Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority 
or a sovereign Palestine, if or when this comes to pass, would, if they applied to join the Commonwealth under King Charles III, certainly meet the original criterion of historic ties with the British Empire. In point of fact, both the Palestinians and Israel have in the past toyed with the possibility of becoming members of the Commonwealth under King Charles III. I'll add those words because they don't add that. In February 1997, the UK's independent newspaper carried a story under the headline, Palestine looks at membership of the Commonwealth. It reported that the representative of the Palestine Liberation Organization to Britain, Afif Salah, had suggested that the PLO might seek associate membership of the Commonwealth as a temporary measure while awaiting the establishment of a sovereign Palestinian state. Once the Palestinians achieved self-determination, ran the story, the Commonwealth Secretary General Amika Anyahuku sees no obstacle to Palestine becoming the 54th member of the organization. I think that they added some members at the time of the writing of this. There were only 53 members. But at the time of King Charles III's coronation, I believe that it was 56 Commonwealth nations. Ten years later, in December of 2007, the Jewish Journal reported, As a former British colony, Israel is being considered for Commonwealth membership. Commonwealth officials said and this was several years back, that they had set up a special committee to consider membership applications by several Middle East and African nations. Those interested in applying include Israel and the Palestinian Authority, both of which exist on land ruled by a British mandate from 1918 to 1948. An Israeli official did not deny the report, but said that at the time the issue was not on their agenda right now. But now that Charles has become the king, they certainly are. And we know that the Rabbis of the Sanhedrin have been saying for the last couple of years that they've been meeting behind the scenes with the Messiah. So they've been wheeling and dealing behind the scenes. The idea of full membership still seems politically unrealistic, but not anymore, I should say. But the prospect of forging some sort of link between Israel and the Commonwealth family of nations has recently gained some substance. And especially now that he's been coronated with the olive oil from the Mount of Olives sitting on the throne chair that contains Jacob's pillar stone, which the kings of ancient times in Israel stood beside. And that pillar is the one that the kings would stand next to at their coronation ceremony. So King Charles III had this stone under the throne chair, the anointed stone supposedly of Jacob, also known as Israel, when he was coronated, just like the biblical kings of Judah, exactly in that manner, and all of their procedures for the coronation. The Royal Commonwealth Society boasted the queen as its patron, and numbers among its vice presidents, the UK Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition, the Commonwealth Secretary General, and all the Commonwealth High Commissioners in London. The Royal Commonwealth Society, under its director, Michael Lake, and back at the time this was written, had embarked on an ambitious program aimed at raising the profile and relevance of the modern Commonwealth. The Commonwealth, he said, has been very introspective. It needs to be more extrovert. In pursuit of that objective, we have adopted a policy of getting branches of the Commonwealth in non-Commonwealth countries. The idea, he said, was to promote mutually advantageous links with reliable friends around the world on everything from business to defense. A new branch of the 
Royal Commonwealth Society had already opened in Helsinki, Finland's capital, when in 2017, the Royal Commonwealth Society opened a chapter in Dublin as part of a campaign to help persuade the Irish Republic to join the organization. The most recent development was the opening in February of 2018 with the blessing of President Donald Trump of a U.S. branch in Mississippi with a view to eventually bringing America into the Commonwealth fold as an associate member, a concept not yet accepted by the Commonwealth, but being promoted by the Royal Commonwealth Society. At the time this was written, Mississippi Governor Phil Bryant, an ally of Trump, was serving as the branch's chairman of the Board of Governance in Mississippi to bring America into the Commonwealth of Britain under their king. You see how it's all going to come together? A major driving force behind the Royal Commonwealth Society's expansion program has been Brexit. The decision of the British people to leave the European Union and Brexit freed the UK from many of the trade constraints imposed by membership of the EU and allowed it to pursue trading opportunities across the globe. Israel has long been regarded by the UK as a prime future trading partner and a UK-Israel free trade deal was already in negotiations. We know that that trade deal passed in March of 2023, and it also detailed the peace and security of Israel with trade, tech, gender identification, and uh, medicine, and creating new tech between the two nations, Israel and the UK. In the circumstances, Israel would seem an obvious future location for a Royal Commonwealth Society branch office because King Charles III is going to be their king. There's no doubt at all this is coming to pass. It is not generally known that Israel boasts an Israel, Britain, and the Commonwealth Association known as the IBCA the Israel, British, and Commonwealth Association, a body formed as far back as 1953 with the aim of encouraging, developing, and extending social, cultural, and economic relations between Israel and the Commonwealth. The Israel, Britain, and Commonwealth Association would seem the appropriate broker to seek a Royal Commonwealth Society connection, leading as in the U.S. to associate membership. How would this benefit Israel? Although the Commonwealth is not a trading bloc, trade between members is rising strongly and is projected to surpass $1 trillion then by 2020. Among the drivers of increased intra-Commonwealth trade is the so-called Commonwealth effect, Trade between Commonwealth members is on average 20% higher and trade costs 19% lower. Compared with in-trading between other partners, enormous potential exists to increase intra-Commonwealth trade even further. Israel's trading ties with India could serve as a template. The Indian-Israeli trading relationship has recently been greatly strengthened while some of the fields in which Israeli expertise is being deployed would be highly relevant to other developing Commonwealth countries. For example, in 2013, Israel introduced a scheme to help India diversify and raise the yield of its fruit and vegetable crops. By March of 2014, 10 centers of excellence were operating throughout India, offering free training sessions for farmers in effective agricultural techniques using Israeli technology and know-how, including vertical farming, drip irrigation, and soil solarization. A year later, no less than 29 such centers were in operation, and now 25 more being set up across the subcontinent. 
One outcome among very many is a made-in-India version of high-quality Israeli oranges, which are about to hit the Indian market, grown from disease-free plants, nurtured through Israeli scientific techniques. A Royal Commonwealth Society branch office in Israel, followed perhaps by associate membership of the Commonwealth, would give Israel access to dozens of developing countries that would benefit immensely from Israeli expertise in cutting-edge agricultural technologies. And the king, King Charles III being the green king with the little green man, <laughs> emblem on his coronation invitation, which I talked about in great depth. We know that he wants to reduce the carbon footprint by going down to net zero. I told you about the 666 of carbon and the king's royal cipher being the mark of the beast. A beast is a king, so it's the royal cipher of the king that is the mark of the beast. 666 of carbon. The king has bragged about getting his carbon footprint down to net zero. So this is his agenda. This is telling you that Israeli cutting-edge agricultural technologies will be involved in a roundabout way. So I'm just pointing it out and expressing it further. Politically, given the spread of Commonwealth countries across the globe, strengthened trading bonds could help develop warmer relations and foster greater understanding between Israel and the rest of the world. Now, the United Nations had reported at the time of the British Balfour Declaration, which caused Israel to become a nation under the British monarchy's rule at the time, another authority states that the fact that the declaration was a definite contract between the British government and Jewry represented by the Zionist is beyond question. In spirit, it is a pledge that in return for service to be rendered by Jewry, the British government would use their best endeavors to secure the execution of a certain definite policy in Palestine. The Balfour Declaration became a highly controversial document. It disturbed those Jewish circles who were not in favor of the Zionist aim of the creation of a Jewish state. The internal divisions referred to by Weizmann, many Jewish communities of non-Zionist convictions regarded themselves as nationals of their countries and the concept of a Jewish national home created strong conflicts of loyalties, notwithstanding the clause in the Declaration assuming retention of their status in the respective countries. So all of this to discover and point out to you that Israel in the Bible was called the Commonwealth of Israel when they had a monarchy under the king of Judah. And it's this throne that they want to reestablish. And it is the Sanhedrin body that selects the king. So they are behind the scenes orchestrating the half shekel coin with Donald Trump's face on it. And that Donald Trump coin that was already commissioned by the Sanhedrin, the anti-Christ, anti-gospel, anti-Jesus, Yeshua movement are orchestrating these things with Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. They are already on the holy half shekel that helps to pay for things related to the third temple. So these coins were already minted a couple of years ago and uh, there was first a silver coin with Donald Trump and Cyrus, and then a gold coin with Donald Trump and Cyrus. Uh, King Cyrus was the one who allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild a temple. So they're seeing and using Gentiles 
to set up various positions. And think about the fact that Jesus said in the last days, see that no man deceives you. The motto of the Mossad is by way of deception. And if you want proof of that, look at um, Sarfati's book about the Mossad saying by way of deception. That was their motto. And so the Lord tells us not to be deceived that God is not mocked. And who is mocking the King of Kings? Who's mocking Jesus but this Sanhedrin? They persecute the Jewish women. And remember, it's the Antichrist that will not care for the desire of women. Whatever women desire, which the Bible commentary says is the Messiah that they desire. So the Sanhedrin tried to pass this bill, but Netanyahu did not allow it to pass against the Jewish women and what they desired, which was to have a Torah scroll at the Western Wall. They wanted to blow the shofar. They wanted to sing and sing praises and dance to the Lord. They wanted to wear the prayer shawls and in some cases wear phylacteries. And this ultra-Orthodox male organization that's Antichrist spirit said no and we will put you in jail if you try to do these things. Well, you have to know this history or you will not understand what's happening that not all Israel is good. This Antichrist spirit was there in John's day and he wrote about it because the Sanhedrin existed and Paul the Apostle had been one of the learned Torah scholars that was part of the Sanhedrin. When I just showed you that clip of Rabbi Richman, who said, you worship one Jew, you're making a mistake, you should worship all of us, because he said, all Jews are paying for your sins, Gentiles. Basically, in those, that's what he was meaning. We are paying every day for your sins. No, you're not. No, you're not. Jesus bore our sins because he's the Messiah King. And with that thought that Rabbi Richmond said this, he is a member of the Sanhedrin, the Antichrist movement. And this is the attitude you can see when the Sanhedrin sets this king back up on the throne and he gets to sit in the third temple that he's allowed them to rebuild, you can see why he will demand worship. Because Rabbi Richmond just told you that they are going to expect all the Gentiles and all the Jews to worship them. Worship that king that they select to be the world leader and to get rid of the United Nations and put the 70 nations delegation right there in Jerusalem with the judges ruling party that will have power and authority given to them from the king and they will rule as kings with the king and it all falls into place. And so I guess for now, this is all I'll say in this segment just showing you that it's coming to life and it's coming to pass and how it's going to all flow and fit together for the last days. So I hope that you will continue to support my work on this channel. If you want to contribute and donate, it's paypal.me forward slash K-K-R-O-C-O-C-O. Or the mailing address for donations is Kimberly K. Ballard, B-A-L-L-A-R-D, P.O. Box 246, Niwot, N-I-W-O-T, Colorado is C-O 80544. And if you want to know who the true King of Kings is that made the eternal blood covenant with many, please get a copy of my huge coffee table size book revealing him for the last days in astonishing ways. And it's called The Almond Tree Aaron's Rod, the Messiah, King of Israel. And it's published and available at olivepresspublisher.com in upstate New York. With that, I'll just say thank you for praying 
uh, for me uh, over the loss of a half-sister uh, whose memorial just happened to be on Tubishvat. You know my book's all about the almond tree. Tubishvat is the almond tree is the first tree to flower. And you know that that's what started my miracle in Jerusalem in my book. And that I sent it in the middle of winter when I was awakened from my sleep with an astonishing revelation about Jesus. And the people on the other end believed it immediately when they read it in Jerusalem. And had just passed by a blooming almond tree. So this is... The time when the tree sap begins to flow after the dead of winter. Would you believe that tomorrow is the day that my mother passed away? And on um, the 27th. And when we had her viewing, it was on the 30th. It was the eve of Tubishvat. And I realized that my father had died the same night as the viewing of my mother several years later, my father died in 2005 on January 30th. And my mother's viewing was on January 30th of 2018. On the eve of Tubishvat, the new year of trees, where the almond tree is the first to flower. And I go into details about this in my book. And it's astonishing. But I just looked up. The passing of this half-sister and it was January 13th she died I looked on the Hebrew calendar would you believe it was the third day of the month of Shabbat and you know the month of Shabbat is the month of rejuvenation renewal it's like the trees being resurrected to life and representing the almond tree menorah the tree of life and coming to life from the dead of winter. So the third day of Shabbat, this half-sister passed away. It was in my book already, published in 2015, that on the third time this lady in Jerusalem tried to pass that almond tree, she was pulled by the arm by somebody very forceful that told her, in her spirit, take a picture of the beautiful tree. So she gets back to the office, opens it up, reads my revelation about the almond tree. And she said, I knew the minute I read your revelation that this message was for you and that this picture was for you from God. And this half-sister just died on the 3rd of Shabbat. And she tried to pass that almond tree. And the third time, she took the picture. And my half-sister's memorial was yesterday on Tu B'Shvat. When the almond tree blossoms. Do you know that when I came back from the viewing on the eve of Tu B'Shvat... My almond tree was full of buds at that time. And the first flower opened when I got back from the viewing on the eve of Tubashvat. Not only that, but there was the next day a super blue moon. And of course, my heart was blue because my best friend was no longer here, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Can you believe this half-sister? died on Shavuot 3 of the Hebrew calendar and is having a memorial on Tu B'Shvat. After all of these things in my book about the almond tree and revealing the Lord for the last days, it is incredible. And not only that, but remember, um, I think it was about a year and a half ago, I showed you that there was almond wood that came here from California that was to be used for firewood. And Penny Caldwell reminded me that that was a picture of the lighting of the menorah. 
So I have a box of the almond wood from California. And then I had that whole story about the almond tree drums that jumped in my feed around Christmas time, the first year after my mom died. My mom knew all about my book. She had just read it, had one year to read it, and then she passed away and went to heaven with all the knowledge in, of it. And the Lord puts this almond tree firewood in my face on either side of the door. So there was like a pathway going into the store. Like it was like a representation of a wall of water on either side. You know, firewood on either side representing the holy almond tree menorah. So you also have, you know, like the three cups on each side. Uh, there's branch, three branches on one side, three branches on the other. You know, you've got the three cups, the three calyx, and all of this. It's all in my book. But I just wanted to tell you this is stunning. So now that's the third person in my family that's died during the Hebrew month of Shavat, which represents the resurrection of the dead from the winter you know, the sap beginning to flow from the dead of winter into the trees so they come to life, so they flower into a new creation. This just happened yesterday, this memorial. I was not, unfortunately, able to go. I pray to God I'll be able to go soon to visit my mom and my grandparents down there and my father. But this is unbelievable. So three people that died in the month of Shavuot. And you know what Moses was doing in the month of Shavuot? Preparing the people for his passing, for his death, so they could go on into the promised land down here on earth while he ascended up into the promised land of heaven, following behind the one that he represented the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Unbelievable. So, anyway, they're trying to, um, they want to put a plaque in a very prolific park there in Dallas. And so they're raising money for that. And it's just amazing. So this gave me hope. And I was able to give her mother hope telling her some of this story. So, I just wanted to share this, you know, when I came back from viewing my mom and saying goodbye to her for the very last time, I knew I'd never see her on this earth again. That first flower opened and I had taken pictures of how much the tree had budded out and took the pictures into my mother's hospital bedside in the master bedroom in the house and showed her that the tree was really loaded with buds that year. And the first flower opened after she died on the eve of Tu B'Shvat. Tomorrow night is the anniversary of her passing into heaven. And I just, you cannot even imagine how the depth of God orchestrates everything. Even in death, we can see that God is in control of all of it, and he's showing signs through these things that just give you absolute hope in eternal life, because this is symbolic of the tree of life, and that through his salvation, Yeshua, we can live forever by the power of the breath of his Holy Spirit that, you know, allows us to live forever and come to life from death. I wanted to share that at the end of this video. It may be making it longer, but I just had to share it. So those are some personal things, but uh, truly astonishing. And I know that my half-sister had to fight Hollywood Goliath, and she helped to defeat the evildoers. So for that, if that was the purpose of her life, she accomplished it. Shalom for now. God bless you. Please support my channel. And thank you. Thank you for some of the people that had sent me some to help me. It's incredible. And I'm just so thankful. 
I'm hoping to be able to go to the Dallas-Fort Worth area this spring, and I can only make it happen through my channel work, so please consider that. Thank you so much. I'll see you later. I hope this really shows you what's coming to pass in the last days and reiterates my last video about King Charles III and the Commonwealth and how it's already been stated that President Herzog had specifically asked King Charles to use his power and his position to broker peace with Israel. I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks, guys.